night started for the kingdom since my life he controls since I gave my heart to Jesus the longer I serve him the sweet Every day my day gets brighter the longer I serve him the sweeter One, I invite you over to Luke chapter number one. I've been wanting to preach this message for some few weeks now, and uh, God has given me some understanding that I may have not have known once before. In Luke chapter two, uh, we find the birth of Jesus Christ, and that's a tremendous story in itself, and and we won't take time to go into much of Luke chapter 2 because it's the birth of Jesus Christ. And I think sometimes we let that birth of Christ get by us. And we contemplate a little bit on the birth and we contemplate a little bit on the life of Christ. But I want to go back before chapter 2 and look at chapter 1 and see a mother. Matter of fact, see two mothers that I hope will be of encouragement to you. So in Luke chapter number 1, in verse number 26, we read of a, ma of a lady named Mary. You can read J verses 26 down to verse 32. Matter of fact, let's read a couple of those verses and we'll go back. But Luke chapter 1, in verse number 26, the Bible says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now go back with me to chapter 1, verse number 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias 
of the course of Abi, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren. And they both were now stricken, well stricken in years. We're going to study this and look at this this morning, but I want to bring a message to you this morning. Two great mothers with two great sons. Two great mothers with two great sons. One man said, if we had more mothers like Mary and Elizabeth, we'd have more sons like John and Jesus. It's a sad day in America that we are losing our nation. And I don't like to be derogatory, I don't like to be negative, but you can't deny the facts, you can't deny the truth. And our world is deteriorating. Our world is slipping away. The Bible says, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. That's what the Bible tells us. And that's very evident. It's very obvious around our world that men are waxing worse and worse. Not to blame the mothers or not to put the blame on mothers, but I believe with all of my heart, men are waxing worse because ladies and mothers are not being what ladies and mothers ought to be. We find it very plain. We find an example in the Bible of two godly women. Matter of fact, God said of Elizabeth, the Bible says, she was righteous. And what he meant by righteous is what she was walking in the commandments of God and ordinance of the Lord. Can I encourage you this morning, dear lady, if you want to be the right kind of mother that God desires for you to be and your children deserve to be, you have to walk in the commandments of God. You'll never be the mother, you'll never be uh, the mother that God desires for you to be unless you're walking in the commandments of God. You cannot do it alone. Just like a father cannot do it alone, a father will never be the, uh, the dad he needs to be except he be in the Scripture with walking with God. We all can understand and realize that motherhood and fatherhood is way beyond our capacity. How many of us in here would love to know uh, uh, raising your grandchildren would love to know how you could have raised your children that way. The truth is, is when you figure out what you're doing, you're out of a job, aren't you? <laughs> when you really get a hold of this thing, when you really understand childhood, and you really understand discipline, and you really understand adolescence, you understand young adults, and when you understand that, guess what? <laughs> They're gone. So we'd like to go back and say, man, I'd like to get back over here somewhere and find out how I can raise my children, be the mother, be the father, that God desires for me to be. I'm glad you asked, because we find it right out of the Bible. God didn't leave us orphans. God didn't leave us without. He tells us here that there's a man by Zacharias. Now, we may preach on him on Father's Day, but Zacharias is a very interesting fellow. He's got a wife named Elizabeth, and we won't take time to do, but if you read verse number 9, verse number 10, and verse number 11, you read about a man that's a priest. He's a high priest, and once a year, he's doing his priestly duties. He's coming into the temple. You can read the story. won't take time to do it, but he, he comes into the temple, and he's burning the incense. He's doing the administration of the, fa- of the priesthood. And he's praying, and, and I love Zacharias' prayer because he's praying for a son. He's praying for a child. And he not only prays for his son and prays for a child, he hears his wife pray for a son and pray for a child. If you know anything about the Bible days, and even yet today, I guess, but more so in the Bible, when a woman was barren, when a lady could not have a child, she was actually looked as a reproach. She was actually ridiculed and made fun of. You can study some Old Testament accounts where Hannah could not have a baby. She was ridiculed and made fun of. It's a real bad stigma, if you will, for a lady not to be able to have a child in the Bible days. Well, Elizabeth is old. Elizabeth, we don't know exactly how, but the Bible says in verse number 7 that she was well stricken in years. Now, you do a little bit of study, and when you see those uh, phrases in the Bible, she could be anywhere from 70 to 80 years old. Now, let's just be just a little bit facetious here just a little bit. Let's let it be a little bit uh, funny here just for a minute. Imagine if you're 70 or 80 year old, and someone says to you, you're going to have a child. Yeah, right. That's what Sarah did. She laughed. You know the story of Abraham and Sarah. God said, you're going to have a son named Isaac. And the Bible says when God told her that, she laughed. 
God judged her later on in that story, but nonetheless, she laughed, and I'd say we'd be the same way. Yeah, right. But she was well stricken in age, and the fascinating thing about this story is you've got a woman, let's say it's 70 years old, but you've got a young lady named Mary that could be only 14 or 15 years old, and she's going to have a baby. This is a fascinating story. I, t- I challenge you to someday, uh, maybe even today, read this story about these two ladies that had an unusual pregnancy. Uh, Zacharias, the Bible says, was praying. In verse number 12, when Zacharias saw him, he saw an angel. His name is Gabriel. And Gabriel came to him to tell him that he was going to have a baby. In verse number 13, his wife was, not him. That would have been a miracle, wouldn't it? Verse 13, But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. And he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, nor he shall be, or he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Oh, dear mother, wouldn't you like to have a son that that was known of your son? That he turned many toward the Lord. They turned many toward God. But Zacharias was praying this. I love Zacharias. He's a, de- uh, a, a godly man. The Bible says he's praying. Let me just say this by way of prayer. Your prayer life is the gauge of your Christian life. Whatever you pray or how much you pray is in direct connection with your Christian life. You say, how, what kind of Christian am I? Can you give me an evaluation test of my Christianity? I can. It's your prayer life. Whatever you're praying, how much you pray, however how much you pray is in accordance with your, with your Christian life. You say, I'm not a very good Christian then. Well, Zacharias was a man of prayer. Zacharias was a man that delighted himself in the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 37, verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. So we understand that Zacharias is praying because he hears his wife Elizabeth praying, and they want a son, they want a child, they want a baby. You go on to read that that's exactly what happens. In verse number 20, the Bible says, Excuse me, verse number 19. And the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and I am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. So Gabriel is sent from God to tell Zacharias that your wife's going to have a baby. Verse number 20. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which thou shall be fulfilled in their season. So here Zacharias has been praying for a baby, for his wife to have a baby. He's prayed, he's prayed, he's prayed. God has heard his prayer, and Zacharias says, I can't believe it. How many times have we prayed and we've asked God for something, and him answered and we stand and say, I can't believe it. It displeased God so much that he caused him to be a mute. It caused him uh, to be silent. It so marveled. Notice what it says in verse 21. When he came out of the temple, when he finished his uh, priestly duties, the Bible says when he came out of verse 21, he says, the people waited for Zacharias. I mean, they're saying, what's he in there so long for? Why are you in the temple so long? Can't you get your administration job done? Well, he comes out and he cannot speak. And the Bible says they waited for him and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. They said, what's taking him so long? You ever waited on somebody? What's taking him so long? And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his administration were accomplished, he departed into his own house. So when he left the temple that day, God heard his prayer. God's going to give him a son, but he's silent. He can't speak about it. What do you think that done to Elizabeth? What do you think that might have done to Elizabeth when she came home and she said, What happened, honey? What happened? Uh, What happened in the temple? Uh, What took you so long? What's going on? What? 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 Are we going to have a baby? Did God answer her prayer? What's going to happen? Tell me, tell me. For the first time in life, she wanted him to speak and couldn't. You know, most of those ladies said, honey, just I'll take care of this. But but Zacharias could not speak and she's so interested in what's going on in the temple. Why can't you speak? And the Bible says in verse 24, after those days his wife 
Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months. You say, why would she hide herself five months? She's 70 years old pregnant. What would you do? I believe I'd go into hiding too, wouldn't you? They're never going to believe this. I mean, could you imagine? Let's just be honest just for a minute. Let's let our imagination. She's 70 years old. What happens when you get six months pregnant? I mean, you're going to need some clothes, aren't you? Who's she going to get maternity clothes from? She can't call her buddies at 70 with her. They don't have any. They're never going to have no maternity. Hey, hey, uh, uh, could you, do you, have, you wouldn't have any maternity clothes, would you? Some of them expandable type in the front. No, no, I, I, I got rid of them a long time ago. Just imagine. I mean, let the imagination from the Scripture, let God let you see some things. I mean, here's a lady that's 70 plus years old, going to have a baby, and her husband can't speak, and she's expecting like, come on, this has got to be something from the Lord. It's got to be miraculous. There's no way this can happen outside of God touching this. The Bible says she hid five months and verse 25, Thus the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein He looked upon me and took away my reproach. There it is among men. There's Elizabeth saying, God has blessed me. God has took away my reproach. I'm no longer barren in the sight of men. But it is a little odd that I'm 70 years old. God's got a sense of humor, doesn't He? God has a a plan that we don't understand. We've got a plan. He's got a plan that we don't fully comprehend. You know, God's ways are bigger than our ways. God's thoughts are bigger than our thoughts. He does things, all things well. But I want to show you what's so fascinating about this story. And I'm praying God by His Holy Spirit will give us the understanding. So get it in your mind. You've got a 70-year-old lady, 80 maybe, that's going to have a baby. And notice this. Now let's, let's, let's put her on the shelf just for a second and let's look at Mary. The Bible says in verse 26, And in the sixth month, that's when Elizabeth was now six months pregnant, the Bible says the angel of Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee and the name Nazareth. Now get this, Gabriel had been over here in Judah talking uh, to Elizabeth. So now he sent that same angel has been sent over here to Mary. Now, don't you stay with me because I want to show you something. He has sent her him over to Mary to tell her some fascinating news. Notice what he tells her in verse 27, verse 28. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women. Now get this in your mind. She got up that morning. She may have heard the story of the Messiah. She probably did. She was a Jewish lady. She was a Jewish girl. Grew up in a Jewish home. So there's no doubt she heard all of her life that the Messiah was going to come. He's going to take away the sins of the world. He is the Messiah. Yes, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming all of her life. But she gets up that morning, puts all her Jewish garments on, goes out through the day, and standing in her presence is a Gabriel angel. And he says to her, You're highly favored among women. And he says to her, Thou art blessed among women. Now, dear ladies, just let your mind go back to the day you found out you were expecting your child. Go back to the day you may not have been expecting that child, but I guarantee you, if we had every lady in this church house to testify, you may not have been expecting that baby, but the very moment you found out you were, you already loved that baby, didn't you? To know and understand that conception is inside your womb, to know and understand that the miraculous thing of birth, there's something on the inside of you that's a miraculous thing, and God put it there. It's amazing. It's amazing. The Bible says when she heard him, notice what it said in verse 29, when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. She heard him and he was cast all these things in her mind, what manner of salutation this should be. She stopped and she said, I'm going to do what? I'm going to have a baby? I'm going to have a child? And she makes this statement. He said, the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son. Thou shalt con call his name Jesus. And he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David and shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be? Seeing I know not a man. 
we would label ourselves, let me just parentheses here, we would label ourselves a fundamental Baptist. And when I mean fundamental, when I mean we hold to the fundamentals of the faith. If you do any kind of sport or any kind of uh, uh, recreational, there's going to be some fundamentals to that sport. There's going to be some fundamental things that you've got to learn. I remember of reading of Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant said when he would bring his new recruits into the college, he said they would set them in, and he said he'd say, Now this is a football. And he would set those men down, and he would give them a test over a football. And he'd set them down and give them a test over how to tie their shoes. What is he doing? He's teaching fundamentals. Can I tell you, in the Christian life, we hold the fundamentals of the faith. And one of the fundamentals of the faith that we'll never move on, we'll never leave, is the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. We'll nail it down a mile deep and we'll never compromise, we'll never remove, we'll never substitute, we'll never take away that Jesus Christ was virgin born of the Son of God. Because the truth is, if He was not virgin born Son of God, He cannot be the Savior of the world. So never let anybody ever teach you or ever try to trick you or ever try to sway you into believing that Jesus Christ was not the Son of God. He is the virgin-born Son of God. The Holy Ghost of God tells us that He overshadowed Mary and planted in her womb the Son of God that come forth from her womb, her never knowing a man. That's a miraculous conception. God did it. God put it there. So we have here Elizabeth. Old, never had a child, 70 years old, going to have a child. And we've got a young girl that's 14, 15 years old maybe, going to have a child. They're both miraculous. They're both unexplainable. There's no way human beings can explain this. And the truth is, they cannot explain it to people. Could you imagine Mary? You know, Mary grew up in the days of the law. Could you know Mary would have her head cut off for what she's going through right now? She's having a legitimate relationship, they think, from someone. I mean, let's be honest. How do you get expecting? You don't get it by drinking water. I mean, it's very obvious she's living in the days when she could have been killed for this. She's living in the days where no one would believe her. And matter of fact, Joseph was a godly man. But even Joseph pondered these things in his heart. And if God had not visited Joseph, Joseph would have put her away. The Bible says he minded to put her away privately. Say, I'm not going to shame her. I'm not going to put her away publicly. I'm going to put her away privately. But God come to him and said, nope, Joseph, don't do that. What she's got in her womb is from me. And Joseph bore the reproach of that. You know good and well they made fun of her. You know good and well they ridiculed them through the town. You know good and well in Bethlehem and Nazareth and Galilee and all those places when, she heard, when it was heard that she was expecting a child at a wedlock, they ridiculed and made fun of her and probably sought to kill her. But God said it's not going to happen. Satan set out to kill her and him since he turned it since Genesis. So we find that God mingled these two hearts together. Mary and Elizabeth, two great mothers that produced two great sons. But I want you to see something. Look with me at Elizabeth. I'm going to look at Elizabeth and give you a few points on Elizabeth. And I'm going to give you a few points on Mary. And dear ladies, I want to try to encourage you this morning to try to rise up and be the mother God has called you to be. And we can learn some things from Elizabeth and we can learn some things from Mary. Look with me, if you will. Notice what he says in verse number 7. Go back with me. She had no child. She was barren. For how long, we don't know exactly, but we do know most of her life, for the, for the duration of her life, she was absolutely barren. Can I tell you something, ladies? If you're in a place of your... Uh, a place where you're not real sure what's going on, can I tell you, just keep trusting God. You, it may not be a child. You may have children. It may be something else. It may be something pertaining to a child. But just know this. If God will bless Elizabeth for waiting on him, he'll bless you for waiting on him. I don't know what it is. It may not be a child. It may be something else. But I do know from Elizabeth's life that she waited on God. You ought to write down somewhere that she waited on God. You ought to write that down somewhere and just nail it down a mile deep that I don't really understand what God's doing, but I can trust Him. 
I can trust him. You know, Elizabeth, something fascinating about Elizabeth, she waited a long time, but guess what she got at the end? It was a great reward. Could you imagine birthing John the Baptist? Could you imagine birthing the forerunner of the, of the Messiah? I mean, let's be honest. She's got John the Baptist in her hand. She's got the man that Jesus said, no greater woman born of, of no greater man born of woman than John the Baptist. I mean, you're birthing in from you the greatest man that's ever lived according to Jesus Christ. She bare a son. She waited on God. She had joy and gladness in verse 14. The Bible says she had joy and gladness because she was going to get to bear a son. I guarantee you she wept and cried like Hannah did. She wept and cried, Oh God, I want a baby. Oh God, I'm going to wait on you. And when she did, she said, I'm so glad I waited on him. Wait on him. We see after this waiting period, God blessed her. And God gave her more than she could ever desire. In John the Baptist. Because in verse 17, the latter part of that verse, he said, the Bible says, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. As I said earlier, I was studying these men of old, and I think about Charles Spurgeon, I think about D.L. Moody, I think about uh, uh, Douglas MacArthur, I think about uh, John Newton, I think about John Wesley, I think about these men that said, John Wesley said he was one of 19 children. And John Wesley on his deathbed said, Oh, I wish I had a Thursday. On his deathbed, he said, Oh, I wish I had a Thursday afternoon. John Wesley's mother, Suzanne Wesley, had 19 children. And having 19 children, you've got to be organized, I'm sure. But in 19 children, she, she set aside a time of day. She set aside a day in which every child had its own time. And John Wesley's time was Thursday evening. And when he was dying, he said, Some of the greatest and fondest memories that I have is on a Thursday evening when my dear mother would sit and talk to me and teach me the Word of God. Abraham Lincoln, when his mother died when he was nine years old, he said, I am and will I always be what my mother taught me. She died, he, he, she died when he was nine. Great men are often birthed by great women. She took away the reproach. He took away the reproach. He prepared a people for the Lord. You know, truly, we as parents, and more so with mothers, want your children successful. There's no doubt about it. We want our children successful. We want our children to achieve. We want our children to this. But there's no greater achievement. Listen to me, ladies. There's no greater achievement than you could ever accomplish in your life except your child grows up to serve God. Ever. Ever. The book of John teaches us that there's no greater joy that my children rise up and walk in truth. To be a CEO of the greatest corporation in the world would be great, but to serve God would be greater. Because the truth is, this breath is going to leave us one of these days, and everything we accomplished in life for this world is going to burn up and give away to someone else. I would to God that my children grow up and serve the same God I serve and love to, have the, to be an owner of the multi-million corporation in this whole world. The Bible says Elizabeth, when she waited on God, God gave her more than she could have ever desired. Wait on God. We see something else is her wisdom. Notice in Elizabeth's wisdom, the Bible says, when Mary, now we're gonna, I'm going to sort of mingle these two together. Now Mary was expecting, we saw that just a few minutes ago, and we see that God sent Mary to Elizabeth's house. Matter of fact, they were cousins. And Mary rose up in those days and went into the country with haste into a city of Judah and entered in the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Now I want you to see this. Here Mary is expecting a child. She's so excited. She runs some 60 or 70 miles from Judah down to where Elizabeth is, from, from where Elizabeth is and to where Mary is, some 60 or 70 miles. So Mary is either running or on a donkey or somehow or another, she gets 60 or 70 miles to Elizabeth's house. She runs in and she says, Cousin Elizabeth, Cousin Elizabeth, you're never going to understand, you're never going to see this, but I've got a baby in my, in my womb. And Elizabeth says, Yep, so do I. What? Yeah. I've got one six months and his name's John. 
And the Bible says when Mary comes into that house and when she, she breaches the door, I can only imagine, of course, Zacharias can't say nothing. You know, he's, he's, he's silent. She runs in, just gives him a big wave, and sees Elizabeth. And the Bible says when she made that salutation, when she spoke those words, the Bible says the baby leaped in her womb. I've got the Son of God in my womb. I've got the Messiah. You'll never believe this. You'll never understand this. But God spoke to me through Gabriel, and He said I was going to have a baby. You're never going to believe this. She said, I already know that. She says, what? You know this? He says, in those days, she ran into the hill country. I, I won't put my notes in her. She must have come to Tazewell. Went into the hill country. So she runs, and the Bible says, verse 41, And it came to pass when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a voice and said, Blessed are thou among women, and as blessed is the fruit of thy womb. She is excited that Mary is expecting I see a lot of wisdom in Elizabeth. I see not only she waited, I only see she has wisdom. I mean, how many ladies can rejoice? I tell you, a, great, a sign of maturity, you ought to write this down somewhere, a sign of maturity is when you can glory in someone else's blessing. When you can glory, when you can praise God for something good that happens to someone else, then you've got some maturity on your side. But if you've got envy and strife and, and, and rejection for somebody that's being blessed, you better check up. But here Elizabeth was not that way. She was full of wisdom. She said, oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. You're going to have the Messiah, and I'm going to have His forerunner. I mean, get now this scene. I mean, they've come into the house, and she is so excited. She has wisdom. She, she has willingness to let her tell her side, and she's going to tell her side. And the Bible says... He shouted, and the voice of the salutation sounded in mine ears, and the babe leaped in my womb, and blessed is that believe, for they shall be a performance of those things which are told her from the Lord. And you'll read verse 46 down to verse 56, and they have a shouting fit. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. I mean, she's having a fit. She's come in. She's really reluctant to tell the story. But when Elizabeth says, hey, I hear you. I feel you. I'm going to have one too. I mean, they had a party. They had a shouting fit. It's her wisdom. I see Elizabeth. I see her wisdom. I see her waiting on God. I see her willingness to rejoice in someone else's blessing. Dear ladies, I want to encourage you. You ought to get around some lady that's going to have a baby and just encourage her. Just help her. Something that I had not seen before. Now get the scene. I want to tell you this part. This is what the Lord showed me. I got this other morning, real early in the morning. You remember the story? Elizabeth was six months expecting when God told Mary. So Mary is running to the house of, of uh, Elizabeth. Inside of her womb is Jesus. Elizabeth is six months expecting. And God tells Mary to stay three months. Six and three is nine. Could it be? Could it be that Mary, God sent Mary to be the midwife of Elizabeth to bear the Son of God in her hands, to bear the, the forerunner of God? Six and three is nine. So here, Elizabeth, the Bible says, is going to give birth to a baby. The Bible says God sent Mary to tell the good news. They had three months of wonderful fellowship. They shared stories back and forth. They fellowshiped one another for three months. And I can't help but think, at the end of those three months, Elizabeth gave birth to John the Baptist. And I can only help and see in my mind's eye, here is a, here's Mary, she's the midwife, and Elizabeth's giving birth. And here's Mary with Jesus in the womb, and she's giving birth. And no doubt the midwife has the first hands on the baby. John comes forth, and Mary says, I'm holding, I'm holding the forerunner. Not only did she get to hold the forerunner, she got to hold the Messiah. I mean, can you see that? That, that? that just thrills my mind that God sent her to a lady and helped her not only encourage her, but to get to be a part of the birth of John the Baptist. We see it in verse 57. Now Elizabeth was full time that she should be delivered and brought forth a son. And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord showed great mercy upon her and they rejoiced with her. We see Elizabeth 
And quickly, I'll give you a thing on Mary. She was highly favored. She was troubled at his sayings and appearances. But she trusted God. Now Mary is the most unusual lady we'll read ever read in Scripture. We do not exalt Mary above women. We do not put Mary, we don't pray to Mary. We don't do anything toward Mary because God said she's a sinner just like everybody else is a sinner. Matter of fact, when they brought Jesus Christ to the temple on the eighth day for circumcision, she recognized that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And she went on to say later on, whatever he saith, you doeth. Giving the proper place to Jesus Christ. So we never elevate Mary above where God elevates her. But we do understand and realize that Mary is a very special lady. The conversation she had with the angel was miraculous. The confidence she had in God was miraculous. And the companion she found in Elizabeth was miraculous. The simple encouragement message this morning is, just wait on God, ladies. You're raising your children now. Wait on God. Pray for your children. Encourage them in the Scripture. Encourage them to serve God. Encourage them to turn many toward the Lord. We can take time to do it, but if you go to Titus chapter 2, you ought to study Titus chapter 2. There's a whole lot in there about the older teaching the younger. Could I encourage you ladies to get with some lady that's going to have a baby or struggling that she does not have one and encourage them. Let me read these two verses out of Titus. Talking to the aged ladies. He says in Titus chapter 2 verse number 3, <clears throat> The aged women likewise that they become in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the Word of God be not blasphemed. Ladies, you got a tough job ahead. I just gave you a list. You said, what can I teach my children? Titus chapter 2, verse number 2 and 3 and 4. Teach your children. A godly mother are to produce godly girls. I was just listening the other day about a lady back in 1986 had three different children and left three children on the step of a door in the neighborhood. Just abandoned them. Just left them. And 34 years later, those three children grew up to find their mother. 34 years later, she had left them on a step of a, of a one on a door, one at a house, one beside a dumpster. Three left three children, three separate times, three different children, and left them. And you think, how in the world could a mother leave their children? And 34 years later, they found her. And it was a reunion. But there's a lot of hurt feelings. A lot of hurt feelings. And the big question those kids wanted to ask their mother was why? Why? Why would you leave us? Why would you leave a baby? I'm talking about with the, with the umbilical cord still attached. I'm talking about just hours old baby, moments old, in a brown paper sack left outside of a building somewhere. It's simply saying, you know our nation is deprived when mothers are abandoning their babies. Oh, would to God that we as Christian folks would get a hold of the truth of the Scripture and be what we ought to be as parents. Dads are right there with them. But I found so much encouragement how good God is. How the Lord bless those two ladies for waiting on God. For living their life for God regardless of what was going on. They bore the reproach, they bore the ridicule of it, and they still worshiped and served God. That's a tremendous testimony.
tremendous. Would you pray with me? <clears throat>